You're listening to the First Corinthians When Immaturity Meets Worldliness series preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Take your Bibles this morning if you would and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We have just finished chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. And for the folks who are here for the first time or just joining us or have been away for a while, in chapter 8, Paul was addressing the idea of Christian liberty and Christian freedom. The whole chapter is dedicated to that. And he's working his way through this topic of what can the Christian do, what, could the, what should the Christian do, what, what can he or she do, under grace. We're given grace, we have freedom in Christ, and so does that mean that this grace tells us we can live any way that we want to because we're saved by this wonderful grace. And Paul says, no. He actually says that the Christian has, to an extent, limited freedom. And we talked about the parameters of that last week. We said that the Christian cannot do what the Bible forbids. The Word of God is our instruction manual. It is our book. It is our revelation from God himself on who he is and how he expects us to live. And so if the Bible forbids something, we don't have the grace or the liberty or the freedom to do what we want to do. It's forbidden. So if the Bible forbids an action or behavior, the Christian is to say no. The second thing Paul said was our conscience. That we have to be sensitive to our conscience, that voice inside that tells us the rightness or the wrongness of behavior. And if we're confronted with an activity and inside we feel, oh, you know, that makes me just feel uncomfortable or dirty or maybe I shouldn't do these things, then Paul says, whether your conscience is weak or strong, don't do those things. When in doubt, don't do it. it. It's really clear. If it's not of faith, then I'm in trouble. I'm condemning myself. And then finally, Paul says in chapter 8, that this freedom should be in the parameters of love for other believers. In this community, in this body of believers, this group of brothers and sisters who gather together here, who are part of this fellowship, before we do something, we ought to take the brother or sister in this place and their struggles and their difficulties into consideration. They should matter to us. We should be concerned for them. Why? Because Christ died for me, and he died for you. He died for him and her and everyone else. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Therefore, we should care for them and not do anything that could lead them into sin and destruction. That's what Paul's talking about in chapter 8. Now, I want to say something to you because I think sometimes... We go through the Word of God and we think, okay, yeah, no big deal. Paul just says, hey, listen, don't worry. Don't go to the temple. Don't eat the food. No big deal. He's asking for them to do something that really doesn't matter. But I want you to know something this morning and and keep this in mind. What Paul is asking the stronger believers in Corinth to do costs something. Okay? He's telling them, listen, don't go to the temple, the idol temple. Don't make a sacrifice there. Don't eat there. And for some of us, you go, well, what's what's the big deal? What's the cost? Well, at the very least, the very least, the cost is a really nice meal. And for some of us as Baptists, it's like, that's enough. If I can't have a good meal, if I can't have my steak and my ribs, I don't want to hear anything else from you, all right? That's the very least. But listen to me. In, In Corinthian society, in the Gentile world during this time, the temple was important because if you were um, a freed man, You'd been involved in slavery, and you were set free, and now you had some patron who took care of you, who they had a god or an idol that they worshipped that, that they believed in, and you told them now, I'm not going back there. You could be cut off financially. If you were part of a union or a trade guild, and, and, and every two weeks or every month they would go back and they would say, hey, listen, we're going to give a sacrifice to these idols, to these gods who we believe are prospering our business and you ought to be there and you as a believer say, you know what, I got weaker brothers and sisters in the church, I'm not going, you could lose your livelihood. If you were part of a family that every week they went to the temple and they made a sacrifice to these idols, this is what their family's been doing forever, and you decided, that's not for me, I'm a believer now, it could cost you losing your family. 
And Paul wants them to know, I know what I'm asking you, there is a cost, but now listen to me. The idea of a cost in Christianity is nothing new. That language is not new for the believer. Listen to these words in Luke chapter 14 this morning, starting at verse number 27. Luke 14, verse 27. These are the words of Jesus, and here's what he says. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, that all behold it, they begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty? Or else, he sees the soldiers, hey, we want peace because we can't do this. Verse 33, likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. These are the words of Christ. And what Jesus is saying is this. Before you jump in, before you come to Christ, before you surrender to him, before you say, yes, he is Lord, he is king, he is sovereign, he is my savior, he says, you better count the cost. It's going to cost you something. Uh, we, we live in a world today where people are promising things of Christ he never promised. If you accept Jesus, you know, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Um, all of your wildest dreams will come true. You'll never have another problem in your life. Can I tell you something? Those are all lies. They're lies. Long before Lynn Anderson sang, I never promised you a rose garden. Some of you know that song. I beg your pardon, right? And we'll not sing it today. I'm sorry, yes. No, you should thank me, actually. Long before that statement was ever made, Jesus said basically the same thing. He said, listen, if you follow me, I'm not promising you a rose garden. A matter of fact, here's what Jesus promises. He promises trouble. He promises tribulation. He promises persecution. And you're saying this morning, that sounds great, where do I sign up? Right? That's crazy. And it would be crazy unless he promises something else. And he promises redemption, reconciliation back to God and forever being in his presence full of joy. And it's worth it. But he tells you this morning, there's a cost. There's a cost. Believer, when we surrender to the will of God, there's always a cost. If we get serious and decide, I'm going to obey what Jesus said, I'm going to look to the word of God and, and draw principles from this book, then there will be times when we will be misunderstood. There will be times when we'll be, the people will be confused about our actions or our behavior. We will be mocked and made fun of. It, it will happen. We will be marginalized. And, and Paul knows this. He says this understanding full well that there's a cost for living this life. And I want you to know something this morning as we work our way through this text and we talk about our freedom and liberty, understand that in all of Christianity, there's a cost. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost me something. But the cost is well worth it. And so Paul closes chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, and now we begin chapter 9. And, and let me just say this to you. There's a sense as we begin 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that Paul is he's, he's changing gears here. He's talking about something else. He talked about liberty that's covered and freedom, and now he's going to be talking about something else. That's not the case. In chapter 9, it's a continuation of this idea of freedom and liberty. That's what Paul's talking about. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at verse number 1. Keep in mind, we are still talking now about freedom and liberty, and Paul's about to introduce himself again to the Corinthians. Verse number 1. Am I not an apostle? Paul says to this, this church in Corinth, you know me, I'm an apostle. The apostle means a sent one. And Paul was sent by Christ himself. He says, I'm an apostle. Then he says, 
Am I not free? And remember what he's he's talking about here. He's talking about you have freedom, you have liberty. I'm an apostle. I have freedom, I have liberty. And then he says this, Have I not seen Christ our Lord? I don't know about you, but there are times when I go through a text, and I hope this happens for you. And maybe you read the text a thousand times, maybe it's the first time, but you read it and something sort of just jumps out of the page at you. It's just sort of in your face. It's like, I've never seen it like that before. I was studying this week in this text. I was reading verse number one. And um, when, I, when I came to this statement where, where Paul says, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? I just stopped. And I thought to myself, what a privilege for Paul who saw the risen Christ knocked on his rear end and he says, who art thou, Lord? Jesus says, yeah, it's Jesus. And Paul saw Christ. And I have to tell you something. I, I read that and I stopped and I just thought, I'm a little envious of Paul. Could you imagine? Wouldn't you love to see Jesus? Hey, let me help some of you now. Some of you are, are forming a, a picture. He is not tall, lanky, skinny Dutchman with flowing blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay? That's, if, 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 if that's a, yeah, I want to see him. He looks like Fabio. All right? That is, that is not, okay, that's not. He, he was born in a Jewish family. The Samaritan woman recognized him as Jewish, right? Chances are he's probably about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, that was the average size of a man in the first century, okay? But could you imagine seeing Jesus to, to look in his eyes? I have to say, I, I think of looking in his eyes, and at first it's a fearful thing. My wife has done something with our boys all growing up. She'll say, look at me. Right? And if they, she grabs her face and look me in the eyes, right? She does that to me sometimes, too. <laughs> and, and, I, and she's going to ask me a serious question. She says, Rick, look at my eyes. And if I had my sunglasses, I've got to take my sunglasses off and look her in the eyes. And I think, oh, I'm busted. Right? She, she, like, she sees through me, right? She knows. But Jesus, so look him in the eyes. These eyes are like a flame, a fire. They penetrate our very soul. He looks into the recesses of our life. He sees it all. It can be a terrifying thought, actually. At the same time, that gaze of compassion, of love, of mercy, who looks upon me as a sinner in need of grace and salvation. And this is Jesus. And um, I know that there's a blessing for us who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus promised that. But to see him. Christian, I don't know what you're living for. But if there's not a hope and a desire in your heart and your life to really see Christ, you've missed it, man. You've missed it. I've been, I've been moving away a little bit from Facebook because I find it so narcissistic, for myself included. And there's so much drama and nonsense at times. But every now and then, you come across a, a decent post. And I found this a couple weeks ago. This was on, I think, Dan and Jen's post. Maybe you've seen this. But John Piper says, Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there, listen to that now, people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. It is a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. If we don't want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. If your idea this morning is, I can't wait for heaven, I'm getting wings, a halo, and Philly cream cheese, and I'm living for this man, okay? If that's what you're thinking... Or you think about all the streets of gold and and, and the the gates of pearl and all these things. And Jesus never enters your mind. You have missed it. The prize of heaven, of all heaven, the reason there is no need of the sun or the moon or the stars or any light is because He is there. He is the glory. He is the prize. It is all about Him. Him. And Paul says, 
I saw him. We should long to see him. Christian, what are you living for? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So Paul says, I'm an apostle. And he says, I'm free. I've seen Christ. Look at verse, the end of verse number one. Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are you in the Lord. And what Paul is saying is, listen, if someone thinks I'm not an apostle, they're crazy, but certainly you can't think that. Because you, this church, those people, the, the church of Corinth, you are the seal, you are the stamp that truly says, I am an apostle of Christ. The reason there's a church in Corinth, the reason lights have been changed, is evident that Paul's message was one that was sent by Christ. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he says, listen, this is who I am. I'm an apostle. I am free. I have freedom. Um, I have seen Jesus, and I'm your apostle. Now what he does is this. He establishes to them, establishes who he is, and look at verse 3. My answer to them that do examine me is this. And apparently, there were folks in Corinth now, as, as Paul is talking about this idea of freedom, saying, Paul, what about you? What about your freedom? Well, you're doing. I can see some inconsistencies here, Paul. And now Paul's going to defend himself as we work our way through. So let's look now at verse number 4. And in verses 4, 5, and 6, I don't know what your Bible says, but my, my Bible uses the word power. Yours might use the word right. And Paul's going to say, now listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. This is who I am. Now I'm going to tell you about my rights. My rights, not just my freedom or liberties but my rights, okay? Verse number four. This is who I am. These are my rights. Have not I power to eat and to drink? Paul says, this is my right. And he's not talking about, don't have a right to get a sandwich every now and then or get a burger at McDonald's. That's not what he's talking about. He is saying, listen, as an apostle of Christ, as your spiritual father, as the one who gives to you, I have a right to, that you maintain my life. You pick up my tab. This is my right as an apostle of eat, to eat, and to drink. Verse number five. He says, there's a second right that I have. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of our Lord and of Cephas? Listen, Paul's not talking about a Mormon reality show here, Sister Wives. Okay? He's not talking about that. He's saying, not just I can marry another believer. That was covered already in chapter 7. What he is saying is this. If I had a wife, it's my right to bring her with me when I travel, and you should be taking care of her as well. That was a right. Now listen to me, just just think of the practical matter of this. How many tele-evangelists in the 80s and 90s would have saved their lives and their marriages had they took their wives with them on their speaking engagements? I have a hunch they wouldn't be doing some of the things they were doing if their wives were there. And if they were, they would probably be dead. That's that's how my wife operates. You'd be dead. Okay? And Paul's saying... I have a right that you take care of me. I have a right if I bring my wife that you take care of her. Uh, her, of her. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Jenny, see what you got me doing? You started that. A right to take care of her as well. Now, just on a sidebar, if you look at this verse, this verse is really packed, and maybe you don't realize how packed it is. But he says, I have a right to bring my wife along to be taken care of just as other apostles. And then he, he says, as the brethren of the Lord, that's packed. Do you know that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born? And after that, her and Joseph had relationships and they bore children. That's, that's what the verse says, as the brother of our Lord. The brothers that he had in ministry were James and Jude. We have their writings. So, so here's Mary, right? Listen, James and Jude, they're married. And then he says, of the Lord and Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter, Peter, Peter's wife went along with him. 
Listen, here you have now by Peter, Paul, and Mary, right? Um, here you have by Peter, Paul, and Mary, not the group, but the originals, all right? This is a dagger, a dagger into the doctrine and teaching that tells the minister or the priest that they must be celibate. It's there. And when you require unnatural standards for a pastor, you will produce unnatural behavior. We've seen it. Moving on, verse number six. I have power to eat and drink. I have power to lead about a wife. And verse number six says, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? I know some of you right now are thinking, okay, all right. The guy only works one hour a week anyways. What, what does it matter? Right. Um, let me just say this. We'll talk about this more next week. All right? um, I've been doing this for 25 years now. 25 years. This. Um, this is a long time to be doing something. Um, and I, I preach at least once a week, every week, for about, uh, on average, 35, 45 minutes, somewhere in there. It takes me, at my age, doing this for 25 years, between 25 and 30 hours a week to prep for these messages. And I'm, I'm not making that up. I'm, I'm serious. I'm not sleeping in an office. I'm, I'm actually studying, right? That's just to preach a message, okay? And so that's why it's important when we're here. I really do appreciate if you stay awake. Because it's like, I just worked 30 hours on this, man. Now, if anyone sleeps today, Mr. Hookstra has a right. Mr. Hookstra got up this morning, and instead of taking his medication, he took sleeping pills. Now, if he uses that next week, he might question that, all right? But Paul says, listen, I, I, I have a right not to work physically because I'm giving something spiritually. So Paul says, These, this is who I am, an apostle. These are my rights. So, 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 so stay with me now. From chapter 8, Corinthians, these are your freedoms here. This is what you're doing. You should not be doing this. Chapter 9, this is who I am. These are not just my freedoms. These are my rights. This is what I have a right to do. And now what he will do is, is go from this in verses from 4 to 6, and now he's going to give examples of how this works in everyday life. This is how the world operates as far as the rights that Paul has. Look at verse number 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? And here's the point. He uses now a soldier, a farmer, and a shepherd. When I joined the military at 17 years old, can I tell you something? I didn't pay a dime. I signed my name. And when I pulled into Fort Knox, I got underwear, I got socks, I got t-shirts, I got a uniform, I got dress blue, I got dress uniforms, I got hats, I got rucksacks, I got shoe polish kit. Now I did have to give them my life, sign over my life, but I didn't pay anything for that. Why? Because no soldier goes off to war on his own. He's provided the funds necessary to do the job. And then he says, a farmer. We have farmers in our church. I mean, Jock is here this morning. And, and Jock, when you grow corn, and not just feed or seed, but, but like but sweet corn, right? Good edible corn. When you harvest it, do you bring in a bag and put it on the table and say, okay, Barb, here's the corn. Here's $40 for the corn. Do you do that? No. Barb would like you to do that, all right? <laughs> and do that. It's his corn. He eats it. He worked. He eats the corn. And then he says, the shepherd who feeds a flock. We have a folks in our church. Nick is one. He, they, have, they have sheep. And he doesn't go out to the butcher and ask to buy some lamb shanks, right? He works, he gets paid from that. And that's Paul's point. So Paul continues, verses 8 through 10. He now talks about his rights, right? He, he appeals to the world. This is how it's done everywhere. And now he will appeal to Scripture. Look at verses 8 to 10. Say these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. For it's written in the law of Moses. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 25 now. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, doth God care for oxen? 
or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. And, and, and listen, understand what he's saying. He's not saying God doesn't care for animals. God does care for animals. He does. Um, but the whole point of that chapter is the well-being of others. And so the point is this. If God says, don't muzzle an ox who is working so they can eat what falls to the ground, then how much more a man? Verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap carnal things? And Paul says, listen, this is my right. I have given spiritually. You have an obligation to give to me materially, carnally, to pay you. Jump down to verse number 13. He's going to continue on here and show this pattern in Scripture. Verse 13. But... Or, I'm sorry, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait, for the, wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? And, and, and this is common sense. He says, look at the, the priest, when the first fruits come in, they get that. That's how it works. They make a sacrifice, they take care of their family. It happened in Judaism, it happened in paganism. Then verse 14, the Lord Jesus commands the same thing. Even so hath the Lord ordained, Matthew chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, um, that they which preach the gospel should live after the gospel. And so, so what Paul's done here now is he said, listen, I've talked to you about your freedoms and your liberties. Now what I've done is this. I've, I've told you who I am. I'm an apostle. I've given you what my rights are. I've showed you that the world operates like this, and the scripture shows us these things, and the Lord himself says that this is my right. Now look at verse number 12. Paul has just given a concrete argument for his freedom and his rights. Verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, I have not used this power. Paul said, I've told you about your freedom. I've told you to restrain, restrict them. Now I told you who I was. I told you my rights. I have a right to these things. And Paul says, nevertheless, I'm not doing it. Now listen to me. Really important, and we're just about done. Hang in there. I want you to notice, first of all, the power of what Paul just did. He not only told them what they ought to be doing, but then he used his own life as a powerful example on why they shouldn't, if he had a right and didn't use his rights, then certainly they could do the same thing. My friend, listen to me. I think we miss the opportunity to have a powerful influence in the lives of other people because oftentimes when we speak, our lips and our language does not match our lives. And so we're out there telling the world, don't be involved in sin. And yet for the believer, we're not aggressively tackling our own sin. We're not allowing God to expose our hearts. We're not showing a pattern of repentance and faith and making things right in our own life. And so when you say those things, your words mean nothing. You lose your credibility. You lose the power to influence because your lips don't match your life. Hey, parents, listen to me. You're going to make tons of mistakes. Trust me. Tons of mistakes. But we're foolish to think our kids are going to listen to us And we're we're upset with their attitude and they're rolling their eyes and their pride and everything's going on in their life. It's like, ah, I'm going to kill these kids. Why can't you just listen? And yet in our lives, we don't confess our pride and our arrogancy and our sinfulness. Not asking for perfection, but listen to me. When our life matches our lips, there's power there. And for many of us, we've lost the opportunity to influence because our lives don't match what we're saying. Oh, and it may be true. It doesn't match. And so notice, Paul's lips and message matched his life. The Corinthians insisted on their freedom and and had zero concern or regard for anybody or anything. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care about what you think. I don't care about your rights. I'm going to live how I want to live. And Paul, on the other hand, as an apostle of Christ... He restricts his freedom. He limits his freedom. He doesn't do what is even his right to do. So here's the question. Why? What in the world to be so powerful 
And think about what Paul's saying here. Paul said, I have a right to eat, to be maintained. I have a right for you to take care of my wife. I have a right not to work. But Paul in the Corinthian church, and you, you'll see this, you'll know this as we go through this book, he didn't take anything from them. He was literally saying, I am not making money off this church. I'm not, they're not paying a dime for me. What in the world could be so powerful that Paul would say, I'm willing to give all this stuff up? Look at verse 12. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You understand something this morning? The advancement of the gospel was foremost in Paul's mind. It dominated everything. And for Paul, all the things that, that we would say not only are important, but that's your right. Paul said, with this church and the way they are, I am willing to forgo all of that in order that the gospel and the kingdom of God marches forward. If the apostle Paul gives up his right, shouldn't we be willing to do the same thing? For the love of Christ, for the love of his gospel, for his church, and for the chance to influence those around us. Christian, it's time for us to grow up. It's not grown up to do whatever you want to do. It's childish. It's immature. It's carnal. We should grow up and mature. We should practice how we can resist or restrict our freedoms. When's the last time that you gave up your rights your advancement, the spotlight, the praise, the recognition, the piece of cake, your seat, your bad attitude, your comfort, your pleasures, our way. This is important. Teachings of Christ, the gospel is not to be hindered. And for too many of us, Christian men and women and teenagers today, in our society, in our culture, we're all clamoring for our rights. I've got my rights. I'm going to do this. And Paul said, wait a minute. There's something bigger than you. There's something bigger than your rights. It's the cause of Christ. It's the gospel. It's the kingdom. And I should not do anything that would hinder that cause. This morning, we must stop clamoring for our rights. Paul didn't say that. These were his rights. Stop clamoring for our rights and our freedom. And start living a life that glorifies God and exalts the gospel of Jesus Christ and says in our own, nat- our own spirit, hey, I don't need that. Is it my right? Yeah, I can do that. But I can give up my way. I can give up my attitude. I don't have to be right. I can give that up. Why? For the glory of gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend, that's what it's all about. It's all about the gospel. And Paul said, these are my rights. But I'm going to set them aside. So don't hinder the gospel of Christ. When's the last time you ever set aside anything for the cause of Christ? I'm not talking about, I'm going to give up my job. No, I'm talking about, when's the last time you quit fighting with your wife because of your stupid attitude and you gave it up because the gospel is bigger than that? You want your marriage to reflect the glories of Christ. When's the last time you flipped out on your kid and you were mad and you, you apologized because you were wrong there because you wanted to show them what the gospel looks like with love and forgiveness and reconciliation? When's the last time you gave up your right when a brother or sister, they were mad at you and you had a right to be mad at them, but you went and you sought reconciliation because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is everyday life. Not some kind of theory out there. And I have a hunch this morning. If Paul, as an apostle who saw Christ, said, "Mm, these are my rights, it doesn't matter. And certainly men and women and teenagers in this church can at least start today to do the same thing. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the gospel of Christ. Let's have a word of prayer this morning.